Are you asking the question, what if, enough in your business? On today's episode of The Remarkable Project, we chat with Jesse Cole, who is the founder of Fans First Entertainment, but also, and probably more notably, the owner of the Savannah Bananas baseball team in Georgia in the US. Now, for those of you who don't know already, Jesse and his wife, Emily, took what could only be called a failing baseball stadium and turned it into one of the most followed sporting teams in the US. How did he do it? Through a deep focus on the experience of his customer. Some examples of uh, what he's done are things like his players wear kilts. He, um, he's got a cheerleading squad called the Dad Bod Cheerleading Squad, which are called the Man Nanas. And uh, also he gives away colonoscopies as prizes to his audience. So off-the-wall ideas that have come into fruition and have really brought their customers to, to the forefront. In our interview and also in his new book, Find Your Yellow Tux, Jesse really goes into depth about how important it is to truly focus on the experience if you want a business that people want to be part of and obviously inevitably share. And boy, do they share. I hope you enjoy the experience of this interview. I'm a massive fan of this man, and I hope you will be too. Jesse Cole. Why do people love your business? What are the unforgettable moments you create for your audience? How do you build a business that people feel compelled to talk about? The Remarkable Project. Jay Tinkler. I really want to talk about community with you today. So, uh, I, um, because I think it is something that I, I haven't heard you talk a lot about, but I know is really important to you. But before I get in there, um, for uh, for some of those people that don't know you and don't know what you're all about, you know, one of the things that's really attractive about you is how you create unforgettable experiences and how you sort of play with the unexpected a lot. Um, can you talk to me about the meetings that you guys have and I guess the criteria that you guys play with around coming up with those moments, those unexpected moments, and I guess what it is that either makes it see the light of day and what makes it not see the light of day? Sure. Well, you know, at first we were just trying to survive. You know, we never had a set plan on creating ideas, creating unforgettable moments. We were just trying to make ends meet. And, you know, you go back to 2015, 2016, and, you know, we came to Savannah with a grand vision of creating something unique with a baseball team, but only sold two tickets in the first three months. You know, it's like anything. It's like what Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. You know, we got punched in the face pretty good, sold two tickets. And then by January of 2016, we were out of money, overdrafted our account and had nothing left. So there wasn't really a bunch of processes to coming up with ideas. It was like, we got to get attention. We got to get in front of people. We got to be able to show them that, you know, Mm -hmm. we're going to create a special experience. So, you know, that's how it started for us. And then when we looked back to, you know, what is the name of our company? Fans First Entertainment. You know, what is our mission? Fans First Entertain Always. You know, we exist to make baseball fun. And how we do that is Fans First Entertain Always. Mm -hmm. So when you come back to that as kind of the guiding post for everything we do, then you start to make decisions based on that. You start building a brand based on that. And so, you know, five, six years ago, it was a struggle trying to come up with, all right, Savannah Bananas, make baseball fun. Well, what if, you know, what if our players do choreographed dances? What if we have break dancing first base coach? What if we have a banana baby before every game that we lift up and sing, nah, Savannah, nah, he, into the Lion King? You know, what if we have a male cheerleading team called the Mananas, which now is just the dad bod cheerleading squad? We started asking the question of what if. And I think what's guided us has been whatever's normal, do the exact opposite. And we didn't have the luxury of being able to be successful by being like everyone else. You Mm -hmm. know, we're the lowest level baseball team there is. You know, we Mm -hmm. came into a market where baseball failed for Mm -hmm. 90 years. No one was Mm -hmm. coming to the games. We had to find a way to stand out. So it started by asking those questions. What if? Well, what would be different? You know, what would be remarkable? What would be unique? And you start asking those questions and then you start developing ideas based on that. So over the last few years, we've developed much more, much better systems. But at first it was just, well, let's challenge the way things have been done. Mm. And I think with anything, if you want to create word of mouth, look at what everyone else is doing and say, all right, what can we do that's breaking the rules a little bit? 
that's a little bit abnormal than everyone else. And look mm. at what are those pain points? What are those frustration points? And what are those mm. friction points? We created the most word of mouth marketing because we were just attacking all the friction points. We were friction fighters. Whereas baseball is long, slow, and boring, you get nickel and dimes, you get advertised everywhere, you pay ticket fees, convenient fees, shipping fees, you name the fees, you pay them all. We said, let's eliminate all that. We eliminated the friction. And that was the starting point for how we started creating some you know, great word of mouth. So was there a point, mate, for where you talk about survival and the, those moments were uh, sort of born out of just wanting to, to survive. Was there a point where you went, actually, no, this is our strategy now? Like, because uh, you talk about the fact that um, you don't really have a marketing or advertising budget, or um, that you, a lot of your stuff it comes out of just turning it back on, turning it on its head, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Am I right about that? Yeah, we spend zero dollars on advertising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Marketing, but we invest everything in the experience. And what I mean, so is there a point? Is Was there a point? There a- is it, sorry, was there a point where you said this is our strategy now rather than it being a survival? Is that? Yeah. So, so when we announced the Savannah Bananas as our team name, yeah. This is after we sold only two tickets. My wife and I were sleeping on an airbed. We had sold our house and we were struggling. When we announced the Savannah Bananas and saw that we were number one trending on Twitter, the fact that we were on Sports Center and ESPN, our logo was on there for 30 minutes and they called it the top banana. Is this the logo of the year? And then we started wow. seeing more people tweeting about it. I was like, huh. Why are they doing this? And they're doing it because would a team really name themselves after a fruit? You know, would a team really be the Savannah Bananas? No team would really do that. It was actually polarizing. And I think, you know, I think if you're not getting criticized, you're playing it too safe. Mm -hmm. And so we realized from that opening launch that Mm -hmm. we created a tension, that that became kind of a, hmm. You know, what if we don't look like every other team and say, let's do our marketing plan and put newspaper advertising and radio advertising and TV advertising? What if we created an attention plan? What if every month we say, what can we do to create attention? And that's a different conversation. Wow. Wow. Okay. So then you've got your team. You've got a group of people that are sitting below you that you obviously need to get on board to doing it slightly different. What kind of backgrounds did they come from, mate? Did they... Were they, was that new to them? Oh, geez. It was new to all of us. The, right, crew, yeah. the crew we started with. Now, when I bought the team, I was 31 years old. My wife was 28. Our president <sighs> of the team, our president of the team was 24 years old. And we had three 22 year olds out of college. What a group we had. If you were to blind us up and say, does this team have any chance of succeeding? 99% of people would say, heck no. Yeah, but that's, right. what, that's what made it amazing. Because what for us, we didn't have the corporate baseball trauma of seeing how it's always been done for other teams. Yeah. We were able to get inspired by PT Barnum, Walt Disney, Carnival Cruise Lines, Ritz Carlton, Chick-fil-A and say, well, what if we brought this in? So, you know, we had a team that was, we didn't know any better and it was the Mm -hmm. best thing that we had, that we had going for us. And so Mm -hmm. we started attacking that and saying, you know what, well, what if we started from scratch? Mm -hmm. What if, what if we were our own fan? Would we want to go to a baseball game? Would we sit through an entire baseball game? Or, you know, what would make us go to a baseball game? Mm. And so we put ourselves, most people are like, oh, we know our fans, we know our fans. But, you know, if your product or experience isn't something that you will rave to everyone about and that you will scream on a mountaintop and absolutely love, you're missing the boat. Because yeah. most teams are like, you know what? I can't sit through a baseball game. So their employees are like, I'm going to sell this to people, but even I can't sit through an entire game. Good luck. So we said, yeah. well, what if we, what if we create something that we'd want? And so we asked those questions. We said, well, you know what? I hate going to a ball game and paying $5 for parking, paying $4 for a drink, $6 for a burger. And we said, well, what if we made every ticket all inclusive? What if your mm-hmm. ticket included all your burgers, your hot dogs, your chicken sandwiches, your soda, your water, your popcorn, your dessert, everything. And we said, well, what about $15? We had no idea how it would work. We didn't know how the numbers would work. We had no idea what it would cost because no one was doing it. But we started with the fan ourselves and said, would we want that? And we said, heck yeah. And we said, would that be something that we would tell everyone about? We said, heck yeah. And then all of a sudden we said, then let's do it. Let's learn. Do and then learn. Most people try to learn for two, three, four years and then try to do. You got to start doing. And that's when the learning happens faster. Mm. You just mentioned customer then. And I think that 
I think when we start off out in our businesses, we sort of focus on, you know, well, I want to do something different. I want to shift it at the paradigm, but then the commercial realities start to kick in as far as the day-to-day and I need to put food on the table and all of that kind of thing. How do you keep it more intentional about customer every day? I'm, I'm not necessarily talking top level, but every day so that you can keep sort of on the finger on the pulse like that. It's the name of our company. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, let's let's be very. It's what do you have in front of you all the time? So at first, yeah. I haven't told many people this. Like when I first started like consulting and working with teams, and I was like, oh, we're gonna start some teams. I was like, oh, we'll call it Team Colon Associates. I was like, that sounds like a terrible law firm or an accounting <laughs> office. Like that that is brutal. That doesn't inspire people. That doesn't yeah. say who we serve. That doesn't say what we do. That doesn't say what we're about. And and so I said, well, well, who are we? You know, who do we work for? I mean, my wife and I are like, we work for our fans. And what do we do? Mm. Well, we entertain always. It's like, mm. all right, well, why don't we just be fans first entertainment? So how do you keep it in front of us? We ask every decision every day. We ask, is it fans first? Before every decision we do, we said, is that fans first? And is yeah. it something that if we were a fan, we would be proud of? And so mm. like, and some of these things are crazy. Like, for instance, the other day we started looking at, let's look at how the way p- players go to bat. You know, if we're trying to make baseball fun and be fans first, players go to bat, they walk up to bat, they get their announcement and they hit like that's boring. So we start saying, all right, could we have a pep band, our pep band, the banana band, literally walk them up to home plate and play music all the way to home plate and give this epic interest? We said, yeah. All right. Then it went viral. And then the other day I walk in and we're like, all right, guys, let's have an idea session where we think of what are the craziest walk-ups we can do for the, for the guys. And we started writing them down. Like one guy was like, Oh, we could have our players crowd surf to the to the batter's box. We could have another guy lifted up like a king on a chair with four people and brought to the batter's box. And we started like, and so what do we start doing? We started testing them. And then in the middle of the game, no joke, in the middle of the game, um, we were constraints foster creativity. Often we look at, oh, that's a constraint. That's an adversity. Oh, you know, we lost this person, a great person, or oh, you know what? Um, we, we lost this account or, you know, we have a very small office or we're in a bad location or whatever the excuse is. Yes. That's the best opportunity to get creative and innovate. So here's my example. Our announcer DJ is the best in the business. Somehow he learned how to play music nonstop during the game while announce, while do everything else sound effect. He's mm. a legend. Mm. He never misses a game, but he missed a game two weeks ago. And so what most teams would do, all right, just hire another announcer. I sit down with our director of entertainment and said, well, what if we didn't have an announcer? What would we do differently? And we started thinking. I like, saw oh, this. I saw yes. this. Yeah. <laughs> but what I said is I said, well, well, how could we do it differently? What if, what if we had fans announce the hitters? What if we had a hype person walk up to the, to the um, uh, batter's box with the hitter? What if we had teammates introduce the hitter? And then in the middle of the game, teammates were introducing. And I looked over at one of our players. I said, hey, Cole, do you want to introduce yourself? And he said, yeah. So he introduced himself coming to batter's box. And then that night it went pretty well. The next game, our our announcer was back. And I said, let's take it to the next level. And I go to Bill Leroy, who's been with us for four years. I go, Bill, do you want to walk yourself all the way up to the batter's box, introducing yourself? He goes, yeah, why not? He did it. He walked himself. He said, all right, fans, put your hands together. Coming from a University of North Georgia alumni from Dublin, Georgia. Number one, myself. And then he got in the batter's box and said, Bill Leroy. And it was on SportsCenter. It was shared by USA Today. It, was yeah. shared. it got millions of views. You referenced it. Yeah. And it was because of a constraint, an adversity, a challenge that we didn't say, do it like everyone else said. Well, what does this now give us the opportunity to do? And it was that organic. And where most companies, they, they, there's too much red tape. You can't just do that in the middle of the game. Mm. We said, why not? And I think if you really want to be a company that innovates and creates word of mouth, you have to be like a speedboat. You can't be a big cargo ship. You have to be a speedboat that can make things happen fast. And that's what we did in the middle of the game. Hey, do you want to announce yourself? Why not? Did it? Mm. And then it turned into a bigger promotion. Well, mate, I'm in Australia and it came across my radar. Like it, it just, and it, and it wasn't some of your stuff either. It was <laughs> news-based stuff. So it, it uh, yeah, that definitely, definitely worked. Um, talk, talk to me about um, those early days as far as, uh, any kind of difficult conversations, um, trying to get the, I guess, your idea for for fans first, and um, but in a new town, um, I, I don't know much about Savannah and how that all sort of plays out. But 
Um, I'm guessing, and from the, your intro videos and seeing some of the stuff of interviews with people, that people were pretty set in their ways when you first arrived. Um, yep. Were there difficult conversation or, or was it just pure energy that sort of um, got you guys over the line? It's funny and it's almost cliche. Everyone talks about like, you know, I wrote this book, but I got rejected by 25 publishers. You know, I, I came up with this idea, but I got rejected by 45 venture capitalists. And, you know, all yeah. that. we were rejected almost every meeting. Your college summer baseball. You're not pro. No one's going to come to wow. the games. We got rejected almost every meeting. And, you know, it was interesting. I think most people, what happens, they, they push through. And, you know, we were trying to meet with sponsors left and right and trying to sell advertising at our ballpark. Mm -hmm. And we were like, you know, it's not working. You know, we sold some and we were doing okay. So finally we said, well, what if we don't have any sponsorship? And, you know, we looked at it and we're like, no, every single sports team in the country has sponsorship. That's how you drive your revenue. And we said, well, what if we eliminated it? And we asked the question, we said, you know, is this something that as a fan, we want to come to our ballpark and look at, advertise everything? Do we want to hear ads? Does anyone wake up in the morning and say, you know what? I hope that I get sold to, promoted to, and marketed to today. You know what? I hope that I get a lot of advertising. I, I need more noise in my life. So I, I want to go to the ballpark where you're supposed to escape, but they just hear ads all night and see ads everywhere. No one says it. But you know what it says about every single sports team in the country? It says that they don't work for their fans. They work for the money. They work for their sponsors. And I didn't believe in that. So when we look at fans first, and also, do I believe it's the best advertising to buy a billboard at a stadium when you can get that many impressions by one click on social media 10 times over to a targeted group of people? No. Yeah, so why are you selling something you don't believe in? And every single sports team in the country who sells advertising, well, well that's where our revenue comes from. Anyways, my point is that we were very clear on fans first. And that guided every single decision. And we started talking to ourselves and saying, you know what? We need to be focused more on understanding who we are not for. Mm. We are not for sponsors. We are not for baseball traditionalists that want a conventional nine inning slow game. But we're not for those people. And so often you got to ask yourself, not necessarily who are you targeting? You know, everyone says, come up with your avatar. You know, who's your target demographic? We come up with who our target demographic is not. It is not baseball traditionalists. It is yep. not the average baseball fan over 60 years old. And when you go that way, then you create things that aren't for them. Mm -hmm. And that deters them even more. So what it does is it attracts a whole nother audience. Like right now, which is crazy. We have more TikTok followers than every major league <laughs> baseball team. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I'll say, we have over 100,000 more than the next highest, the Chicago mm -hmm. Cubs, which are a national global brand. But why? Because we focus on who we are not for and we create fun, unique clips, dances, trends, all those things for the young audience because we know that we're not for the baseball traditionals and we're not going to show typical baseball clips. And that attracts like a magnet, younger audiences that want to see the bananas on how we're going to make baseball fun next. Yeah, and I, I noticed that some of your players have sort of almost adopted, especially around that TikTok stuff, um, have adopted, I guess, being motivated themselves or being quite self-motivated around a lot of that and sort of building their own I guess, personal brands. Um, is that coming from you guys from an empowerment perspective or is that something that just um, comes out of the, the freedom of this creativity with, as an organisation? Well, you and I opened talking about trust. Yep. And when you talk about trust, you know, I think trust a lot of times it comes down to how much do people care about other people? Mm -hmm. And when it's very clear that we, before a player gets a uniform, he goes through an orientation with me. Before he gets a uniform, the owner mm -hmm. of the team, and I say, I want this to be the best sum of your life. I want this to be the most fun you ever had playing baseball. But here's what it's going to look like. And I tell him all the stories, the fans' first stories, which there's tons, you know, of, you know, family tragedies that players have done things for families. I mean, it's unbelievable, the stories that mm -hmm. we build. And I share that. And they realize at that point, it's bigger than baseball. But what happens, that trust is formed when they see myself as the owner, our president, our entire staff. We're leading the march before the game. Literally an hour and a half before the game, fans are lined up for almost a half mile. It happens every night. 
and we lead the march out with the pep band, the banana bananas, the bananas, and we lead and we're dancing and all whole team, all of our cast, everyone, we're dancing, we're clapping. And you see all the people have their phones up videoing. People are clapping. They're blown away. And you see all these people that are coming from states all over different countries and they're clapping and cheering. They're not cheering for the baseball. Mm. They're cheering for how this team, the characters, the personalities, the players make them feel because they are having fun. And so what happens there, talk about trust. Immediately, I paint that vision of what's going to happen this year and how all those things are going to happen. And then it actually happens. And at the end of the night, hundreds of people are waiting to get autographs. Hundreds of people are taking pictures and they're treated like legends. You get that feedback loop from our fans that says, you know what? Thank you. Not thank you for the double you hit. Not thank you for the strikeout you made. Not thank you for the big hit to win the game. Thank you for delivering a rose to my little daughter in the middle of the game. Thank you for coming in the crowd and signing autographs. Thank you for when my son came up to you and asked for an autograph and you went down to a knee and say, only if I can have yours first. And you had my son sign your hat. Mm -hmm. That builds trust because they get that feedback and they say, you know what? This is special. We're going to do more of this because it's worth it. And so that's where you get this buy-in and it's taken years. At first, there was so much skepticism. I know you have my book, my first book behind you uh, and the stories about the players that didn't want to pitch or that didn't want to dance. They didn't want to dance because of all the craziness. And mm-hmm. now people realize that it's, it's bigger than baseball. And I think any company, if you can really share that on how you're bigger than selling your trinket, selling your service, that it's how you make people feel, then you get this amazing trust that it's, it's so contagious because you want to keep building it over and over and over again. But you just talked about gratitude and I've heard you talk about gratitude because that's something that you've actually put into your practice. And I'm not sure whether this is still the case, but at least early on, you made a, 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 a whether it be a daily or a, a regular practice, I guess, of expressing gratitude. Is that still something that you do? Is that still yeah. something? I mean, obviously, but as, a, as, a, as an intentional practice? Yeah, how it started was uh, uh, we read the book One Word. Um, we're constantly reading. We pay our people to read. We do book club. We're big into reading. Um, yeah. Our two of our, our final words of our fans first way are growing and hungry. So, and that's what I had to do. When I first joined the industry, I had no idea what we were doing. I had to read from somebody. And yep. so uh, I read the book One Word and uh, the word uh, for m- my year, you pick one word and it's the word that you kind of follow. Instead of a New Year's resolution, which 87% fail, uh, you pick one word and that's your word that you follow. Ironically, gratitude was my word last year. And my, my wife's word was optimism. So uh, uh, it's just two good words for 2020. Let's put it that way. Uh, but uh, anyways, I chose care and I said, well, I got to hold myself accountable. So I said, well, what if I wrote a thank you letter every day? And I started writing down all the people in my life that I write thank yous to, old coaches, authors, uh, teachers, uh, friends, family members. And I got to like 40 or 50. And I was like, oh, shoot, the year is 365. How am I going to do this? But I started writing. And I wrote to my English teacher in, uh, in so- sophomore year of high school. She wrote back a letter, four-page letter, said, I've never received a thank you letter like this. Uh, oh, this means wow. so much. I've been teaching for 30 years. I sent one to Simon Sinek. Uh, and I got a phone call from him. And I answered the phone. And I go, hello, this is Jesse. He goes, Jesse, it's Simon Sinek here. I go, shut up. Who is it? So I told one of my mentors to actually shut up. Uh, and, and what happened was after 40 days, my list kept extending. And I started looking for gratitude. And I think... Um, what you look for is what you find. And so give you an example. Um, when I sold sponsorship back in the day with our first team before we eliminated mm-hmm. sponsorship, everywhere I drove, I'd see billboards. Everywhere I looked, I'd see magazine ads because I was all I had a lens to look for that. Now I could barely even notice an ad. But you know what mm-hmm. I see every day? I see things to be grateful for. I see people I talk to, people that sent me a letter, people that sent me a package, people that just are, are kind every day. You know what? Our, our mailman that comes to the stadium every day, our people that clean our stadium every day, our people. And I see it. And now because of writing a thank you letter for now, geez, five, six years straight, um, it's a huge part of my life. And it's really helped me when things get tough. Um, And I think it's a huge part to uh, really deliver great experiences. You got to be grateful for the opportunity to deliver those great experiences. I often sort of uh, think um, Stephen M. R. Covey talks about trust begetting trust. And um, when you were talking then a minute ago around uh, the gratitude that your fans give back to your players. I, I kind of feel like it's a cultural thing that your players are seeking out that as well and creating opportunity for, um, I guess, gratitude both ways potentially, which is 
No. Well, well, think about this. Think about this. Obviously, there's been some controversy on, around the Olympics, and uh, you know the gymnast Simone and and, yeah. and the pressure and the pressure mm-hmm. for all Olympians. It's pressure to succeed for a sport, not pressure to succeed on the impact they make on young kids or other people mm-hmm. in your life. Mm-hmm. It's the pressure to get a gold medal. The pressure, mm-hmm. that pressure. We don't put pressure on our players to win. Mm-hmm. We talk about how do we create more fans first moments. If there's any pressure they feel, it's how do they have more fun and how to deliver more fans first moments. And what happens is that actually impacts a better performance on the field. We won more games than any team again this year. We've done it every year. We win more games than any team in the field uh, and in the league. And it's because you think about, you know, are you putting pressure on people to perform or are you putting pressure on on people on how they make others feel? Mm. And that's a different type of pressure. Mm. And that's something we talk a lot more about. Mm. Matt, I wanted to talk to you about, um, I don't know whether you've read the book, uh, Fanocracy, um, David yeah. Newman Scott. Yeah, I love David. Yeah. My pod. yeah, I love David. Oh, really? Fan- fantastic. Yeah. So we're on the same page. Amazing. I haven't actually listened to that interview. I surely will. Can you t- talk to me about proximity? And for everyone that's sort of, I guess, listening to this, the, the idea that um, David talks about this idea of, um, uh, that there, there's science around how close you are to, um, uh, I, I, I guess, in this case, um, the business, the organisation or the opportunity to be close that creates a, um, a, a lasting impression and obviously creates obvious, uh, um, that, that, I guess, fandom that you want to be able to achieve. How do you manage that within... The bananas. So is there a level of um, trying to make sure that there um, that there's distance to make those moments special when they are close, or is it you know what every opportunity to be close to our fans is is the is um, what we should be aiming for? Again, going from the 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 mindset of fans first. And then also whatever's normal do the exact opposite. We said, mm. well, in Major League Baseball, there's barriers. Players yeah. are stuck on the field. There's a barrier. Even signing autograph, you're reaching over a wall. Like yes. that's how it is. And so we said, well, what if we broke down the barriers? And I know there's a trend here. We're, we're seeing, the, I've probably said what if like 30 times. But <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, it's probably the best way to start when you're trying to think of new ideas. Say what if. And so we said, well, what if? you know, our players went into the crowd to deliver roses to little girls every game. Mm. Well, what if when we honor the military, people that have served our country, what if the players came into the crowd and shook hands when the people who have served our country, you know, what if I, every game do selfies in the crowd and talk about proximity, you know, David was talking about selfies and fanocracy. I do 200 selfies in the crowd. Yeah, You know, every night we have uh, a sing-off we're literally, I get in the crowd and so does our MC and we're in the middle of the crowd and we're singing with the fans, mm-hmm. you know, every night. And before that, I go up an inning early. You know what I do? I sit with groups of kids and I eat their popcorn. I literally start taking their popcorn and eating their popcorn. And, and what happens is people start laughing and, you know, I eat a lot of popcorn and we have a lot of fun. <laughs> but, you know, I'm an owner of a team. If you look at the normal way, where are owners? Where are most owners? They're in the suite. They're in the yeah, owner's yeah. suite. You know, they're separated from the fans. That's not the way it should be. Walt Disney, before he passed, he walked Disneyland all the time. He had to get in disguises often, but he walked. He walked with the guests. He gave so much criticism to his staff that they always wanted to meet up at the office. He said, no, let's go walk around Disneyland. We'll meet and talk there. Let's get around our car guests. And so I think that that breaking down the barrier. Uh, is mm. so crucial to what we do. And we script our games to break mm. down the barrier. Mm. You know, when we score our first run, the players run through the entire crowd celebrating. The entire team just runs through the crowd, high-fiving fans. It's the ultimate breaking down the barrier. And fans yeah. love it. The other team is like, you guys, what are you doing? I'm like, this is our moment. We're going to do this. But that's what makes you feel that we are in this together. Can I share one quick story? Go for it. Yeah. The biggest aha moment came for me when we did our one city world tour and we're going to come down to you in, in a few years. We're going to make it down. We're going to take the banana show all over the world. I, I, I have that big vision. And uh, we did a one city world tour uh, in a little town in Alabama. We chose one city to take the show to. And somehow we sold 7,000 tickets in 24 hours. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And I'll, I'll never forget at the end of the night, 
The game was over. We're playing our new game, Banana Ball, uh, which is mm-hmm. a whole other story. Game finished. We had a surprise fireworks show. Didn't tell the fans. Every team in the country tells fans what a fireworks show is. We said, we're just going to launch it. Fireworks show, boom, to the Greatest Showman soundtrack, of course. All right. Everyone's celebrating. At the end of the night, fans didn't leave. They stayed for almost an hour. They were just staying, getting autographs, talking with our players. All of our players, all of our cast, our banana band, our male cheerleading team, everybody was out in front of the stadium hanging out with fans. The band finishes their set list. And all of a sudden, a couple of band members start singing Stand By Me. Mm. As they're singing Stand By Me, I watch as players from both teams, our cast and fans, our mascot, our umpires, they put their arms around each other and start singing Stand By Me. And I actually pulled my phone out of my pocket and videotaped because I was like, I'll never forget this moment. And now every night after every game, all the players, the fans, the band, the cast, the staff put their arms around each other in a big circle and sing Stand By Me. And I think that is something that I would describe as magical because there's no barrier. We are all in this together and we mm-hmm. all feel like we belong and we're a part of something. And we talked mm-hmm. about trust earlier. If you want to build trust, feel like you belong and you're a part of something together, you'll have an unbreakable trust. And I think mm-hmm. that's what we're on the way to creating. Yeah, wow. I I wish I was there, even just listening to, yeah, uh, got the tingles from listening to that. Um, mate, tell me about um, Walt Disney. You mentioned Walt Disney before and you talk about him a lot. What is the greatest lesson you've learned from him? That's like a, that's a very hard question. Okay. Give me, give me the, give me the, I'll share, I'll share a few. I'll share a few. Yeah. I'll share a few. So it starts with vision. You know, Mm -hmm. Walt concepted the idea of, of Disneyland by sitting on a park bench, watching his daughter on a merry-go-round and saying, I wish there was a place where parents, adults, and kids could have fun together. And when he had that vision, that little idea, he became obsessive with it. And I think he, unlike many people, might have a little idea, but he pursued it with vigor. And he said, all right, what are we going to do to make this vision come alive? And from there, you know, he is the best and greatest storyteller that may have ever lived. You know, you think about the great authors and Mark Twain, all these, you know, uh, Shakespeare and Dickens and all them. Mm. Walt Disney is the best storyteller there ever was because he created a story in real life. And he created a story with millions of characters. Every day, they're changing. Everyone that comes into Disneyland, Disney World, or any of the parks, you're a part of the story. And Walt crafted it from the first time you walk in and what you see and how you see the train and the flowers and the smells and how you go from this land to this land. He created a story that you were a part of it. You're a you know, we love you're movies. Open, yeah. We love movies, but he did it. And he maximized the opening shot. Everyone said, told him, why we spend so much money at Castle? Why spend so much money on landscaping? You need to have multiple entrances. He goes, no, no. I'm going to create an opening shot just like a movie and a closing shot just like a movie. I'm going to control the experience that people have when they walk in and what they feel and how they feel like a little kid and they're excited. I'm going to control that. He knew that in 1955. Yeah, right, yeah. And so when you think about that, and once he built it, And I think the greatest lesson, if you want to go the greatest lesson, he said, Disneyland's a living, breathing thing. It'll never be complete. He said, we will always continue to plus the experience. And that concept of plussing, Walt used to go on rides and he said, whenever I go on a ride, I always ask what's wrong with this thing and how can it be improved? He wasn't a negative person. He wasn't a skeptic. He was always interested in plussing the experience. And for us, every night at this ballpark, we do four to five new promotions we've never done in front of a crowd. And every night we plus four or five things that we've previously done and added a new addition to make it better. And I think that is what Walt did. And that's why you go 50, 60, 70 years after his death, that Disney is still plussing the experience. They have built their whole streaming system after that name, Disney Plus, to continue to add new things to create great magical experience for their guests. Mm. No one was better than Walt. You talk about plussing a lot. And, and I, I remember listening to you talk about the, uh, your schedule for a uh, an evening um, in comparison to um, where it is, where it was and where it is now and the difference in um, and layering and that kind of thing. So um, I'm interested about that. T- tell me about 
last impression. Well, here, let me, let me, say, let me jump yeah, in for a second. Go for it. You, know, you, you talk about how you're so passionate about word of mouth and remarkable. Mm. Well, well, what if whenever you decide to do something, you ask that question, is this remarkable? Mm. Would this create word of mouth? And so when we look at every single promotion, we go, we judge our, our marketing and our ability to draw, uh, create unforgettable experiences by, will people share this? If yes. people won't share it, then it's not, and I'm talking about sharing on social media. I'm talking about sharing it verbally. I'm talking about sharing it in every way. If they won't share it, it is not remarkable. It is not creating word of mouth. So when we ask that constantly, it helps creating a filter to what are we creating? So for instance, today, I just had a meeting right before this about our bathrooms mm -hmm. and I've challenged our designer. I said, I want remarkable. I want, wow. I want people to say, this is not their bathroom. And so we've gone back a few times and she came back and she, <laughs> uh, she came back with a concept called club flush. And it's literally a full fledged, almost dance club, swanky upscale club lighting disco balls. We have a golden uh, throne toilet. It is like, it, it's ridiculous. And yeah. we have a 1926 ballpark, old ballpark. If you yeah. walk in there, all yeah. of a sudden the music's bumping. There's we have um, a yellow carpet leading you into the bathroom. There's yellow ropes. All of a sudden the lights are flowing. There's gold disco balls. How do you not walk in and say what? Hey Johnny, come hell? over here. You gotta <laughs> check out the bathroom. Susie, come over. Check out this bathroom. And then why wouldn't we be giving away, you know, uh, neon lights or giving away the glitter sticks or giving away whatever that is? Something else that they walk away that can also spread the word. And so mm. we don't think make the bathroom nicer. We think make the bathroom remarkable. And that's when you look at every piece of your experience, you never have to spend money on marketing. You spend money on the ideas in advance that then creates all the marketing for you by your fans. Just touching on shareable there a little bit, mate. Uh, is there any other criteria besides what you've just said? Um, uh, let me preface this with saying that people talk about that if you make it too complex to share, or, uh, or um, get in the way of people's ability to share that yeah. you also uh, have a problem with it, it being shared. And if you're, yeah. one of your criteria is, can people share this? Can people show people this? Is, does that come into it for you? Or is it that when you're in your, no. Okay. No, 100%, no, it does. It does. 100%. Oh. It does. Yep. Yeah. I mean, a quote from uh, Jeff Rosenbaum, whoever says the most in the least amount of words wins. And this was, uh, you know, Steve Jobs was a master at this and yes. everything he thought about was design and designing. Yes. And, you know, and I learned from him, you know, he would, when he would do a launch of a product, they would strategically write the words, a revolutionary new, they would say these words about the product. So they got on all the headlines. Yeah. And so what I started doing is literally, I manifest the words that I want people saying. So to give an example, just this year, I started saying, as I introduced the team, you know, Fans, it's time to get on your feet to introduce the most fun team in baseball, your Savannah. So now people are starting to say this, it's the most fun team in baseball. And instead of saying Grayson Stadium, what do I call our ballpark? I call our ballpark Banana Land. Fans, you're getting crazy here in Banana Land. And when we first started going on the road with our One City World Tour, what do we put in the press release? The world famous baseball circus. And so when you start using short, powerful concise words all the people in mobile who never heard of us the world famous baseball circus is coming to mobile i'm like thank you <laughs> you know we've never done it before but that's what we want them to say and yes. so, so think about what gets you excited you know when you're creating you're writing and you're designing do those words do all of those words matter enough world mm. famous baseball circus is four words fans first is two you know, when you think about that, banana land, we made one word. We didn't even want it to. We wanted to make our own word, banana land, yes. where, the world go, where the world goes bananas. All right. Yeah. And so when you start crafting that, it takes time. You know, it, it's, it's um, simplicity is very, very hard, but it's worth it. And so I think mm -hmm. with your language, your marketing, you know, I told when we were designing this club flush or whatever we're designing for our bathroom, I said, it needs a slogan. It needs a powerful slogan that people will take pictures of and people will say, and I go, it's not there. Like she had a quote in which I thought was great. It was a, no one loves a party pooper, which was kind of fun, but like, that's a good thing for maybe the stall, but let's have a slogan. And, and um, I think it's worth it to invest the time and the bandwidth to find those words because they live on. And I think that's so important. Do you put a dollar figure to any of these experiences as far as, and I hope, I hope I'm not trying to make it 
boring by talking about this, but as far as the commercial aspect, mate, is do you go, if we can do this right, it's worth this much to the business or is, is it really an overarching strategy that goes, I know that if we just go all in on this, this will be um, successful financially too? If we looked at dollars on investing in the experience, uh, we wouldn't do 90% of what we've done. Gotcha. It, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to spend thousands of dollars on a banana band. It doesn't make sense to pay a professional high fiver. It doesn't make sense, you know, a male cheerleading team that are just come to the games anyways. All these things, it doesn't make sense for the yellow carpet. It doesn't make sense to paint our, our, our bases yellow. It doesn't make sense to have to make a hundred dozen minimum order of yellow baseballs from China to be able to have custom yellow baseballs in the future when we play banana ball. None of those numbers make sense, but they make perfect sense. Because when you invest that in the experience, you invest that, then everyone else is doing the marketing for you, which you know, the stats are staggering. You know, it, what it's like, it's like 92% of people trust a recommendation from a friend or family member more than any advertising. So then why are we spending 92% or more of our money on advertising? Spend 92% of your money on creating a better experience that the friends and family members will tell more people about. And so, mm. you know, we're obviously smart business sense in that we know that we need to, you know, be profitable so we can take care of our fans. But we just made a bulk order of banana moon pies, thousands of banana moon pies. All right. I don't even know if they're good or they're delicious. I think they're just, they're just funny. But what we realized was that fans were leaving between 8.30 and 9.30. At 9.30 and 10, when the game ends, we have the pep band, we have the DJ, we have the players out, we're doing autographs. It's an unbelievable celebration. The stand by me happens, all of that. But from 8.30 to 9.30, what's their remarkable moment? So we bought thousands of banana moon pies. So our, our staff saying, we're over the moon for you. You know, have this banana moon pie. And we're throwing over banana moon pies to fans to have one more little touch. Yeah. Nowhere yeah. in any financial business model is to say, yes, that makes sense. Spend $4,000 on banana moon pies to give out in the we'll middle see. of the game for yeah. just some fans. But it makes perfect sense. It's funny. Every question that I've asked you that is about turning it back on me as the organization or you know without saying it literally you know anything that becomes selfish or not about the customer um i'm feeling it coming back to you're looking at the wrong person here jay you're looking at the wrong person which is stop looking at yourself and keep investing fans first in it <laughs> there's two conversations that you can have part of any business you can mm. have how do we create fans and how do we create revenue Mm. And they often, very rarely, they're two different conversations. How do we create revenue? Raise prices, charge for this, charge mm. for this. How do you create fans? Give this away, do this extra, add this. But what happens is when you do all that, the revenue all takes care of itself. I'll give an example. Um, are you familiar with Chick fil A? Yes. All right. Chick fil A in the States is massive. All right. Put in perspective McDonald's, the gold standard. All right. Mm -hmm. They do about 2.5 million per store, McDonald's, right? The average fast food restaurant does about 800,000, okay? So McDonald's, yes. 2.5 million. Chick-fil-A does 6 million per store. Whoa. And they're shut down 52 days a year. 52 days a year because uh, of they're very religious and they closed every Sunday. And they're doing twice the revenue of the next biggest competitor. Now, when I go to Chick-fil-A, when... Our staff goes to Chick-fil-A. When our team goes to Chick-fil-A, they don't have a dollar menu. You know, you go to Taco Bell, you go to Burger King, you go to any of these places. What's on the dollar menu? What's on the value menu? They don't have it. Their prices are higher, but no one looks at it. You're at Chick-fil-A. They're going to say my pleasure. They're going to take care of you. It's a better quality food. It's a better quality experience. They're going to move you faster through the line than anyone else. You don't even look at the price. You say, you know, I'd like the spicy chicken deluxe. I'd like the Chick-fil-A sandwich. I'd like the grilled chicken. There's a difference. They're playing a different game than everyone else. I believe no one pays attention to our price. And how do I know that? Because right now, as every game sold out over the last five years, fans have been buying tickets at anywhere from $100 to $150 on secondary markets when our normal ticket is $20. Mm. Crazy. And it, crazy. And, and I think that's when you learn, it's like, hey, invest in the experience and price becomes irrelevant. Wow. All right, um, mate, we're going to start to wrap up. But um, I wanted to, first of all, thank you um, and show my gratitude towards you because I, I think 
Um, your energy, even on the opposite side of the pond, is infectious. And um, uh, I just love the way in which uh, I think I use the word abundance. You show up with just such abundance to everything that you do and your energy is just off the charts. So I appreciate it. Mate, where can people find you? Where can people engage with you? What is, um, what can we do? <laughs> Search Savannah Bananas. We are, we are out there. We're po- constantly putting up videos. I think, you know, I think you can learn as much from watching how people do things versus just what they say. And I hope I've shared some lessons and some stories and things we've learned. But, um, you know, you can check out the Savannah Bananas and how we're trying to dramatically look at everything differently and have fun with it. And then uh, myself, I post on LinkedIn uh, almost daily, every couple of days and uh, uh, share the lessons I've learned because you talk about abundance. You know, I I wish when I was 23 years old, um, I wish Walt Disney and PT Barnum were alive so I could go talk to them and see them. But fortunately I was able to read their books and learn from them. So I, uh, I want to share everything I can uh, during my journey. Okay. And as as a um, final question, I'm asking everyone this question because this is what the, the remarkable project is all about. What we're trying to do is understand the ingredients that go into building a business that people feel compelled to talk about. Now, you obviously have lived it and you've also now spending time in other organizations going, this is how you should be doing it. So you've spent over 10 years um, living the phrase, stop standing still, start standing out. What is it and how do you believe you build a business that people feel compelled to talk about? Oh, well, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of answers there. And I think I share in the fans first book, which is upcoming, uh, the new fans first book, change the game, break the rules, create an unforgettable experience that I talk about, you know, the five E's, you know, you got to eliminate friction. You got to entertain always. You got to experiment constantly. You got to engage deeply and you got to empower action. And if you're able to do all those, you will create fans uh, more than you ever imagined. But, you know, I think if I could sum it up and bring it down to uh, something on the back of our fans first playbook it says, uh, be patient in what you want for yourself, but be impatient in how much you give to others. You do that, everything else takes care of itself. Amazing, Jesse. Thank you so much, mate.